wrote this down again here. So what you're given is you have a given sub, so, so you have a, the, the space Rm and you have some subspaces Hi, k of them. And here the dimensions are called them Di, just for simplicity. And now you're given linear maps from Rm into Hi. Okay? And you assume that these maps are essentially isometries. In other words, that Bi, Bi transpose is actually the identity on this Hilbert space Hi. Okay? Now, furthermore, assume that you have some constants Ci, non-negative constants, so, I mean positive, in fact, otherwise you wouldn't count it, uh, so that the sum of the Ci is Bi transpose. Notice, here is Bi, Bi transpose, here is Bi transpose, Bi, is equals the identity of the whole space. Okay? Now, if you take any functions from your Hilbert space into the positive reals, it doesn't really matter what, the, I mean, you need them positive because you raise them to the power c, right? Then you compute this product here. This is always less than the right-hand side, okay? So, so what this in some sense says, it's a kind of a correlation inequality, right? Because, you see, these, these spaces are all pretty crooked. They don't have to be in anything aligned with Rm. They can just hang, hang in there somehow. And so this is, this is, in some sense, a very highly correlated integral. Right? Nevertheless, you can show that this is less than this number here, which is just involves the integrals of the fj's, and the constant is sharp. And it's, in fact, saturated by Gaussians. Okay? So let me make an example where it, I, I think most of you have used this inequality implicitly at some point in the proof of the Sobolev inequality. Right? So let's make an elementary example. Sobolev's inequality says uh, the, the L1 norm of the gradient is, is, is greater or equals the, some constant maybe, uh, the L n over n, uh, n minus 1 norm. And u is a function from Rn into the real set. Huh? And I, I choose it to be u, uh, certainly C1, say, with compact support, so that all the computations which I do now are fine, right? So how do we do that? I mean, you rem remember this from the textbooks, like, like Craig Evans's book on PDEs. I think it's totally standard. But what is it? You start out by writing that ux, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, you can always write, uh, write this as the integral from minus infinity to xi. And then you take the partial derivative du, dxi, and then you have x1 up to, and here in the ith place, you put in t, and then you go on up to xn. Right? I mean, that's obvious. <laughs> now you notice immediately that u of x in magnitude is less than, I mean, let me just do it here. I mean, it's so elementary, right? Saves time. So this is less or equals when I just put an infinity here and put some magnitudes here, right? Okay? So what you get, it, let me call this function here g i of x1 up to xn. And you notice that this function has no decay in the xi variable, right? No decay whatsoever. And then what you do, you, you compute the integral of u of x to the power n over n minus 1. And you estimate it by the integral of the product i equals 1 to n, g i of x1 xn. And then you integrate the x1 dxn. And I guess I forgot a 1 over n minus 1. OK? Now I claim that this right-hand side, the way I can write this here, I can write it in the following way. If I choose to, to, to make the matrix bi of x when applied to x, it's just the one which gives you x1, xi minus 1, put a 0 in the ith component, and then you go on. That's a linear map, right? And you can easily check that this linear map, so what is your Hilbert space? Your Hilbert space is simply the subspace where you just drop one coordinate, right? It's just one of these hyperplanes. So therefore, you have these guys here, 
what are the BIs that defined it for you? The BI, BI transpose, obviously, is the projection. Right? I mean, it's the identity on this space. And now, what about this relation? Okay? Well, if you, if you sum up the BI transpose BI, well, that's a kind of a triviality, right? What is it? You get a diagonal matrix of ones, and at one point you miss one, and you have a zero. Okay? So therefore, what is the sum when you sum this from i up to n, from 1 to n? Well, that's just n minus 1 times the identity. So therefore, you go here and put the 1 over n minus 1 here, and you get the identity of your whole space, right? Okay? So you have verified that. So what does this theorem say? It says that when I raise these functions gi to the power 1 over n minus 1, this is just less or equal the product j equals 1 up to n, the integral of the gi's of x1 up to xn, dx1, dxn. I shouldn't say that. And, and you should say here dx i hat, because I'm not integrating over this variable, right? I'm integrating now over this Hilbert space, hj. And then you raise this thing to the power 1 over n minus 1, OK? So in, in some sense, when you look at the textbooks in PDEs, the way you prove it is you use a repeated argument with Hölder's inequality and some induction, right? But I think it's instructive. It's a totally elementary example, I know. But it's, it's instructive because, in some sense, what you're using here is an old inequality which goes back to the late 40s by Loomis and Whitney. They invented this whole subject. Now, of course, that we know what this is, right? That's just the product of the integrals of the du dxj's magnitude dx over all of Rn. And you raise it to the power 1 over n minus 1. OK, and that implies, of course, the Sobolev inequality, right? It's, it's obvious, OK? So, so this, is, this is how this, this stuff works. Now, yeah? Uh, so, I, I forgot the product here. So, so when you replace it by the gradient, you have the power n over n minus 1, and that works out perfectly, right? So it's, it's a completely elementary example, but it, it shows sort of an application. Yeah, Xavier. Ah, this is for a convex set. Yeah, so this is a different theorem. This, this, yeah, you see, Brascom and Leap, they had in the 70s a whole bunch of papers, right? And this paper is, is, is this famous paper, uh, where, where, where you, what, what is it? When you take a log concave function and you take a marginal, you get again a log concave function. It's very specific for log concave functions. And then what they do is, as always, you, you look at the Dirichlet eigenfunction. And how do you think of the Dirichlet eigenfunction? You think of it as the limit of the heat kernel, right? OK? So what is the heat kernel? By the Trotter formula, it's a huge integral. But since the potential is convex, uh, the, the domain is convex, you can see that this integrand is a log concave function. And now you take marginals, it's still a log concave function. So the grounds it must be log concave, right? This is different. This is very different. No. No, it's no. No, you see, this, this has nothing to do with log concavity. Right? The Fs are just arbitrary functions. OK? No, no. Uh, that, that's different. I mean, it's interesting. So, OK, well, let, let, let me tell you. Uh, the, the log concavity plays, of course, a role in many way, things, right? And so there's a little story. Namely, remember that this, this has something to do with, with uh, Jose's talk about rearrangements. So, so when you look at, at the general rearrangement inequality, right? You take a whole product, product of functions, right? Uh, and, and, and you rearrange them, and things somehow go up. The way Brascom and Lee prove it is they reduce it to characteristic functions, and then you have these characteristic functions, right? And you start moving them together. And they have a flow. 
a discrete flow. And whenever they join, then uh, you, you define this as a new characteristic function, right? And it turns out that this flow, this, 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 this integral, is always an integral over log concave functions. And then you can use, again, some kind of, it's, it's like a Bruminkowski type inequality, and that gives you the rearrangement inequality, right? It's extremely clever. Turns out, however, it was already discovered with the precisely the same proof in 1950 or something by Rogers in number theory. So, so this is how these things come. So it's very hard in this business, right? I mean, there, there has been a huge amount of work in this kind of thing. All right, so now let's go on. Uh, I would like to give you a proof of Braskamp leap, which is actually not very difficult. And, and it, it's, it's a proof using, as you might figure out by now, heat kernels. And this was an idea which we developed jointly with Eric Carlin and Elliot Leap. And for a special case where these functions, these matrices, are rank one, right? Just projection on a single vector. And that was then picked up by Bennett, Carberry, Christ, Christ, and Tao. They, they did this in the general case. And what I would like to show you is a very simple proof using these ideas of that inequality. All right? So let's do that. So how does it go? So, so the, the, the idea is the following. You start out with your function. Right? You, you, you think you have given your functions here, right? And these are functions which we have to imagine they live in this Hilbert space. And now what we do is we take fi of biv. Now, if you allow me, let me drop the i for the moment, right? I'm just taking a generic matrix, right? A generic, a generic matrix from these guys here. So this F is just that here, okay? Because I don't want to constantly write the indices. So, and now what you do is, uh, let me let get, get the variable straight. Otherwise, I get confused. So, so now what you do is you convolve this with the heat kernel. And uh, let me just, so what did I do? Yeah. Here I put the W, and here I put the V minus W squared over 4T. You integrate over all of Rm, and then you put, of course, your favorite power here, which I think is this one. Okay? All right. So now what I'm claiming is that this is a function which looks like this. It looks like, let me get some more chalk. It's a function of B, V, and T. Okay? You see, that's, at the face of it, not totally obvious that this is the case. Right? Because, I mean, what does this, this heat kernel do? It just, you know, plays around with this, with this function, and there's no question, I mean, it's not clear at all that this isn't generally true. This has to do with these kind of assumptions here, which I made. Okay? All right, so let me convince you that this, uh, that this is really, that this integral is really of that form, okay? So how do we do that? Well, since you know that B, B transposed, is the identity on your little Hilbert space, then you can say that B transposed B is an orthogonal projection. I mean, obviously, when you square it, you see, when you square this one, you have a BTB, B transpose B squared. It's BTB, BTB. This together gives you the identity on your Hilbert space, and that's just BTB. Right? And it's obviously orthogonal because it's self adjoint. Okay? Good. The next observation is, let me erase this now. The next observation is, that when you map P with B, and again, on account of this relation, right? When you hit this by B, you get the identity, you just get B. So what you figure out is that the B 
is really a map from the range of P into HI, and it's an isometry. Okay, that's what you need. All right? Good. So this is elementary, right? And this is just this assumption here, that this, this crucial assumption. Let me erase this now. And just remember what the P is, okay? All right, so now that then what do you do? You start splitting variables, right? So you take this whole integral, one over four pi t to the power m over two, and then you write this as e to the minus. Here I leave the v. What do I do is I, yeah. I put here pi v minus u squared e to the minus I perpendicular u, v minus u prime squared, and I, I will explain right away what I'm doing. And then I have f of v u. P, sorry, p prime d u. Okay, so what have I been doing? Well, I have been plugging in the PIV, so what is the U? Where do these integrals run over? Hmm? The U, run, uh, the, the U, the last one, runs over the range of PI. I hope I'm doing this right. Yeah, okay? This integral here runs over the range of PI perp. Right? So these are two orthogonal, so I have split the whole Hilbert, the, the whole space Rm into the range of Pi and its orthogonal complement, the range of Pi per. Okay? Good. And now you see what happens. When you look at this integral over U prime, this just integrates out the heat kernel. You don't see it. You agree? Right? It just integrates it out. You don't see it. But you lose a power on this 4 pi t. And what is the power? Well, at the end of the day, you have an integral over a d-dimensional dim space. So what you get is, I can just erase now d here. This is gone. This integral is gone. Uh, this integral du prime is also gone. Agreed? And I can just forget about this here. Okay, now what is this? Now the U is already in the range of PI, so I just have to observe that PI um, V minus U, I can write it this way, because U is already in the range of PI. When I square this, what is this? This is nothing but BI V minus U. Because BI transpose BI, uh, so, Did I? Yeah, no, that's right. No? no, that's right, that's right. What is the PI? The PI was the B, P, P, sorry, forget about the I. P is B transposed B, right? So that's what it is. Okay, so let me do this again, wipe some more. What you're left with is just B, V, minus u, I can forget about uh, bu. And here this p I can forget. And at the end of the day, what is b? b is an isometry. So when I change variables, I do not change the Jacobian, right? So I can simply call this w, w, and this time I don't in, in integrate over the range of pi, but I just integrate over h. And you see, that's precisely what I've been claiming, okay? Moreover, what this formula also shows is that when I do this, that the right side doesn't change. You see, that's the beauty. Why? Because what you have done is you have applied the heat kernel on this function f, right? Integrated over this, this, this Hilbert space here. And when you take the L1 norm over this Hilbert space, the heat kernel just disappears, okay? This is clear? 
I hope this is not too difficult, right? It's a simple linear algebra thing, right? It's no big deal. Okay, so, so this is justified, right? And, and absolutely crucial is for this justification that we had this, this assumption here. Okay, good. So now let's go on. So now we are in the, in the same situation as we have been in the last hour. What do we do? The right-hand side under this heat flow is fixed. The left-hand side, we have to show it's increasing. So let's try to do that. So let's see what the formulas tell us. <clears throat> Let me clean this up a little bit here. F of W. That's what we have. So now, I usually, as, as always, I write F as e to the phi i. So now I need, I need the indices again, right? And remember, these are now functions which depend on t. And what you learn is that the partial derivative of d phi i dt is, of course, Laplacian phi i. And this is, I have to be really careful, this is the Laplacian with respect to the variable v, right? Because that's the way how I move my functions. This was my definition, remember? OK? Plus the gradient with respect to v of phi i squared. So once you sort of accept this, then of course you can differentiate ddt, the left-hand side, which is this gadget here, which is nothing but the integral of e to the sum ci phi i of bi v and t, and then you integrate dv over all of rm. That's what you do. So when you do that, you do this differentiation, what do you get? Of course, it's, it's completely elementary. The sum of the ci, uh, the Laplacian of, with respect to v of phi i plus gradient with respect to v of phi i squared times the exponential. Huh? And integrated over rm. Okay? That's what you do. So not, no miracles or any kind there. So now, of course, you see, at this moment, you don't really know what to do with, with this term, right? So, so it's always a good idea to integrate it by parts, right? So when you integrate this by parts, what you get? So inter parts, we get, well, we get that this derivative of this integral e to the sum ci phi i is nothing but the integral of grad v phi i squared, that I keep, and then I get minus, and what I get is the sum ci grad v phi i squared. e to the sum ci phi i. Right? Why, why is that? Because, you see, when you integrate by parts in v, then you hit this guy. Okay? And what you pull down is, you see, what you have here is then what's left over is the sum of the ci gradient phi i. That's what's left. But from here, you get also the sum of ci gradient phi i. So you just get this guy here squared. Is this right? Yeah, I, I, I forgot the sum. Thank you. Right. That's absolutely crucial, of course, right? Thank you. Okay? So far, so good, right? This is no, no big deal. Okay, so now <clears throat> we have to worry. What, what would you like to see? We would like to see that this gadget, this whole integral is non negative. And at this moment, you agree with me, there's certainly no chance that you can use somehow this measure. This has come alone from this term. Sorry, Mike. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so, so. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, without you, I would be completely lost in this business here. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, you, saw, you see, that's an important point. Here's the CI, and here, in some sense, the CI squared. I mean, the CI, CJ, right, when you multiply it up. Okay? So, so far, I think, so good. Good. So now, as a next step, so, so let's just concentrate on these parentheses. So what is it? When you think about what this gradient is, remember what you do. You take this function phi i of b i v t, and you take the gradient. When you work it out, what it is, it's the b i transposed, OK? And then you get the gradient, if you like, in its own variable of phi, evaluated at b i v t. So what is this? This here is a vector in your space h i. Right? That's what it is. I mean, think of this h i as, a, as a, it's a, it's a linear subspace. Uh, the b i pushes you into this linear subspace, so when you take when you work out this derivative, you get precisely this gradient in the subspace, which is a vector in the subspace, h i, applied to b, uh, uh, and you apply b i transpose to it. Okay. So, so now, what do we have to do now? And I think I don't need this computation anymore here. Let me call this vector here vi. Because, I mean, uh, there's nothing I can do about this vector. It's just a general vector in the hi. And so what is the inequality which we have to show? We have to show that the sum ci vi, sorry, here I have to put in vi transposed. Right? That's what comes in here. And I have to show that this gadget is greater or equals. Now, what is this? This is just, let me see that I didn't screw this up here. This is always my problem here. A sum. Uh, let, let me call it y squared, and what is y? Some ci, bi transposed. OK? It's good. This follows simply from this differenti differentiation here, right? Using this file. OK. So, so you see, so far, everything was smooth writing, except we have never really used this condition here, and that's what we have to use now, right? So let's compute y squared. And the way I'm going to write it is, it's going to be this, the sum on i, ci, bi transposed, vi, and then you take the inner product with y, with y. So this is an inner product. And now what you do is you move this bi transposed over. So that's the same as the ci bi dotted into bi y. Now you remember this constant ci on the, are, are positive. And now what we're going to do is we're going to just do a simple Schwarz inequality. This is less or equals the sum of the ci vi squared to the power one half times the sum ci bi y squared to the power one half. Okay? So, now two things. What can you say about bi transposed to vi? Well, remember, bi bi transpose is the identity. So therefore, I can forget about this bi transposed here. Because after all, what is this? It's the inner product vi with bi, bi transposed vi. 
the IBI transpose is the identity. I just forget about this. OK? So therefore, let me write this again. The inequality which you really would like to prove is this one. We're almost there. Look here. We have y squared is less or equals some ci vi squared to the power 1 half. That's good. What is this expression here? This expression is nothing but the sum ci bi transposed bi in the product with y. But this is the identity. So therefore, this is y squared. So therefore, we have this estimate here. You cancel the y. You square it. And there you are. That's it. Right? It's completely elementary, right? I mean, once you have this idea of heat flow, and you understand what these things do for you, it's completely smooth sailing. So this is the proof of, of the brascombe leap inequality. Now, notice, by the way, when do you have cases of equality? Well, no, I'm not done yet. Wait, 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 wait. I only have shown that the derivative of this gadget goes up under the flow. I mean, the, 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 this, this, this left side is increasing. That's what I've shown. So what we have to show is what is the limit. You have to compute that. And so we go back again. Let's plug things in. Let me just... So remember this formula? This is really our f of bvt, right? So let's go and compute. So what is the product over j, f of bj v t power cj? Well, that's equals to 1 over 4 pi t to the power cj. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. Yeah, cj dj over 2. Uh, sorry, let me, let me say this better. Sum cj dj. Can you still read this up there? So why, where does this come from? You see, each term has a 1 over 4 pi d over 2. And then I raise it to the power cj, and then I take the product, which means I take the sum in here. OK? That's number one. And then I get a product Yeah. Then I have a product of such integrals. I'm going to write this slightly differently. I'm going to write this as e to the minus the sum on j, and here I put a bj v squared over 4t. So in other words, what I do, sorry, I square this out, and the leading all the terms are precisely these guys. Okay? And then I have left over an integral, a product over integrals. And how do these integrals look like? It's e to the minus, so here I call it wj squared over 4t. And then I have a plus 2bi v dot w divided by 4t. So that's all up here in the, in the exponent. I integrate over the hi's, and then I have here the fi of wj. Huh? Ah, yeah, i, I, is equals, uh, I equals j. That's my convention. <laughs> By the way, I have to apologize. The letters n, u, 
K and R, they look all the same in my handwriting. So, okay. Okay? It's good? So now, you see, uh, n now you let T go to infinity. Okay? Now what happens? This term, what does it do? Con this, this term converges just to the integral, and I forgot something else. I forgot to raise this to the power C i, and likewise here, I have a C j, right? You have to raise it to these powers. So what happens? Well, as t goes off to infinity, what do you get? This looks asymptotically for t large. How? Well, let's look at this guy. What is the sum cj dj? Go to this relation and take the trace. If you take the trace, what you get? You get the ci. What is the trace of that matrix? It's going to be the, the dimension of your Hilbert space, because it's an isometry. So that ci di, they sum up to m. So we have the relation sum ci di equals m. So therefore, the asymptotics look like this. You get a 1 over 4 pi t to the power m over 2. And now what is this? Well, this, of course, is precisely, using this relation, the length of v squared. Right? That's what it is. And finally, what does this guy behave asymptotically? These things behave asymptotically as the product over the integrals fi over your Hilbert space hi to the power ci. Okay? And finally, what you have to do in this integral inequality, you have to integrate over the v's. When you integrate over the v's, you just get one. This is just one. It's the heat kernel, right? Normalized Gaussian. That's it. So you increase monotonically towards this, 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 this right-hand side, right? Because you, you see, this is precisely the right-hand side. This integrates to 1, you're done. And in fact, you can also figure out what the, what, what the optimizers are. The optimizers, in general, have to be Gaussians. Although one has to be a little bit careful. Sometimes it can be something else. Okay? But Gaussians will definitely do. Okay? Good? So I think this is not a big deal, but it's, it's, it's a pretty good result, right? As I say, it's, it's a correlation inequality that you have a very highly correlated thing here, and you can still estimate it in a reasonably sharp way. Good. So far, so good. This is what I, what I wanted to tell you about the brascombe leap inequality. There are some other things which you can tell, I will tell you this later on. I would like to go now to get back to the Katz model. Hmm? And so what's the news so far? Well, they haven't been too good, right? As I explained to you, if you want to study approach to equilibrium, if you do it with the gap, the gap is not a really good notion because uh, the, the, the L2 norms of probability distributions are too large in general. Uh, then you can do it with the entropy. And with the entropy so far, we only got a rate which actually vanished as n goes to infinity, so in other words, you need astronomical times to see something like equilibration. Now, you see, let me just uh, explain a simple physical idea. If you take uh, a bottle of hot water and you dump it into the Adriatic Sea, what will happen to the bottle? The bottle will start cooling down, and the Adriatic Sea wouldn't see anything of that, you agree? It's so huge, it doesn't warm up really because of a bottle of water. Hot bottle. So, in other words, in this system, the Adri Adriatic Sea acts like a thermostat. And in fact, for the, for the weather patterns, that's an important point, right? It really acts like a thermostat in that sense that it really uh, uh, regularizes the temperature in, in the environment around the, the, the sea, right? It's a very important point. Okay. So therefore, we, will, we will, would like to understand, in the context of the Katz model, interaction of a system with a therm thermostat. Okay? 
So, interaction, so system interacting with a thermostat. So, so how do we, how do we think about this? Well, the way you could think about this is that you have a, this system of Katz model has m particles, right? It's a finite system. And what this, what this system does, it interacts with the reservoir. And how does it interact? It scatters with particles in the reservoir. But remember, the reservoir does, doesn't change. It just stays what it is. So what you do is you, you pick out with a certain probability distribution which has to do with the thermal state. You scatter with your particles in the system. And then you throw away this particle which you pulled out of the Adriatic Sea, so to speak, right? So what you do, you write down a master equation, which looks like this. Df dt is equals m qm minus identity f. Well, that's the old cut story, right, which we already know. But now we add on another term. And this is just a coupling constant, sum j equals 1 up to m dj minus the identity f, and I call this whole thing L infinity f. And what is bj? bj looks at the face of it quite complicated, but it really isn't once you think about it. Let me write down what it is. Rho of theta, d theta. Then I put here F of the DJ. Okay, I mean explain. Huh? Let me explain what this is. It looks a little bit complicated. Hmm? So let me write down what the W uh, star is. WJ star is equals to V1. Then here at VJ, you put in cosine theta plus W sine theta. And then you go all the way to Vm. Sorry. That's, that's the Vj star. And the Wj star is nothing but minus Vj sine theta plus W cosine. So, so let's, let's, let's think for a moment what this is, what this means. So you see what this is telling. This here is known as, I mean, it's the Gaussian, right? And what is beta? Beta is 1 over kT. k is the Boltzmann constant, and t is the temperature. So this is how, in statistical mechanics, the temperature actually appears. So, and, and this is what you call... The, this is an equilibrium system. And what you do, you take out of your uh, thermostat a particle. And this particle is distributed according to this Gaussian, has this probability. And then what you do is you take this particle and you make a collision of this particle with the jth particle in your system. All right? So then you take the average, rho theta d theta, and then you integrate, because in general, these this, this velocities of these particles are distributed according to the Gaussian. You just integrate over dw, right? So this is, you, you, you can make a, 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 an absolutely clean explanation of that in terms of probability, but I'm not going to do it because I have a little bit limited time. So that's, that's the system. OK. And now you ask yourself, well, that should have good properties, right? Because when you have the small system interacting with the thermostat, you should really see how it goes towards equilibrium. And it should do so fast, OK? So here are the facts. So first of all, a little observation. The energy is not conserved anymore, of course. Right? In fact, when you calculate the energy, we call it kinetic energy. That's one half the sum, the integral of the sum 
of the Vj squared integrated against f, the solution of this equation, you can actually figure out that dk dt is equals to minus mu over 2 times k minus n m divided by 2 beta. And this is what people know as Newton's law of cooling. And you can also easily see that gamma m, which is e to, which is beta over 2 pi to the power m over 2, e to the minus beta over 2 sum of the v squared is the unique equilibrium split. Okay, so your system starts out in some state, right? Interacts with the thermostat, and she really drops down towards this equilibrium state. You can easily check that when you stick it into the equation. Here, you get zero. Why do you get zero? Because this function is rotationally invariant, so the cut doesn't see it. And you subtract the identity, don't forget, you get zero. What does this guy do? Well, when you stick in a Gaussian here, you actually reproduce this very same Gaussian. So this is also zero. But it's more, right? It's really an equilibrium state. OK. I'm just telling you the results. Huh? Now you can go and write down the entropy with respect to this equilibrium state. So what is it? S of f is the integral of f log f divided by gamma m. Okay? Reasonable. Huh? It's the entropy, relative entropy. Entropy with respect to the equilibrium state. You would expect that this guy behaves nicely. Theorem. Bonetto. Uh, y dianatan. Myself. By the way, Federico Bonetto is really one of the experts in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. He's a student of Giovanni Galavotti, so he sort of has the right pedigree. So when you look at f dot and t, so in other words, you solve this equation, you plug it in, right? This is bounded above by e to the minus mu rho t s of f0 dot. And f0 is the initial condition. And what is mu rho? Mu rho mu times the integral rho of theta sine squared theta minus pi to pi. And uh, 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 Rangini Vaidiyanathan, she was a student of Bonetto. She actually showed that this rate is sharp. You can actually write down a state which behaves exactly that way. It's a function. You can take 1 over 2 pi, then you get just 1 half. When you, because you average, right? Yeah. But you can also do it in general. We didn't publish this, the general case, but it goes exactly through. OK? Good. All right? So this is, this is good news. You agree? You have this thermostat. You have this system which interacts with the thermostat. And it does precisely what you expect. Small systems coupled to large systems, they really go towards equilibrium extremely fast, nicely with an exponential rate. And in some sense, that's what you would like to do in statistical mechanics, right? You're not interested in packing all these molecules in a corner and wait until this whole thing equilibrates. What you do is you make some local disturbances, and you ask yourself, how do these disturbances go back to equilibrium, right? That's what you really would like to understand. OK. So then let's see. What we can do. So you see. What I have assumed tacitly, of, of course, no, well, not, not tacitly, it's obvious, right? I have assumed that the thermostat is infinite. So you might ask the question, what happens if I assume that the thermostat is finite but large? So in other words, it's not a thermostat, it's a reservoir. Just, you take a large system, finite, 
you couple it to the small system. What can you say? Okay? I mean, what you would think is that the small, the, 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 this new uh, uh, interaction between the finite system and, the, and, and this reservoir, when the reservoir is large, should very much resemble somehow this system here, right? So we have to write down some inter interesting interaction. So let's do that. <clears throat> so, so we have a system of m particles. And a reservoir of n particles. And of course, we're going to assume that n is certainly bigger than m, right? And now let me write down some notation. In the system, I, I call the particles, the velocity of the particles in the system, I call them v, and the, 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 the particles the velocity of the particles in the reservoir W. So this is, and account it this way, it has some notational advantage here to go on from M plus 1 all to the way to W M plus N. Okay. And now what you do is you write down the master equation, DF DT, it's equals LF, Notice it's L and not L infinity. This infinity points towards the infinity of the, of the, of the thermostat, right? And what is L? And the L has a few terms. So the first term is lambda s m minus 1 sum i less than j less or equals m greater or equals 1 or ij minus identity. What does this describe? This is precisely your old Katz model of the system, right? The system, the particles in the system are allowed to collide. That's what they do with this term. And then you have, of course, the reservoir. The reservoir has also particles, and they're also allowed to collide with each other. And the, the way I'm going to write this, lambda r, n minus 1, sum i less than j, less or equals n plus m, greater or equals m plus 1. Then, of course, I have an Rij minus identity. And notice, by the way, this is precisely the reason why I chose this notation. I don't have to distinguish the Rij, right? And remember what is Rij? It's just the old story where you take the Ij plane, you take your function, and you average over rotations in that plane. That's all you do. So, and now you need an interaction between the reservoir and the particles. And the way you write this down is it's mu divided by n, and I have to explain this, a double sum, i runs from 1 to n, m, and the sum, j runs from one, m plus 1 to n plus m, and then you have rij minus the i. Okay? That's what you have. So, good so far. Now, Okay, so I, 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 let, let me start over there. I keep this. So now what you do? You see, of course, you're not going to choose any arbitrary initial condition. That would be silly. Yeah. Five minutes, right? Yeah, so that I have another five minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, 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 I take this into account, right? Okay, perfect. Yeah, no, no problem. So, so what is the... the, 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 the uh, so I forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Initial conditions, right? So you see, if you choose, you're not going to choose arbitrary initial conditions. What you, what you would like to say is that initially, the reservoir is in equilibrium, right? It's just, so you choose initial conditions, which look like this. F0 of V and W is equals some function FV times E to the minus. And by the way, allow me 
this is a little bit silly, but I always use beta equals 2 pi. The reason why I want to do that is, I mean, you agree, you can choose the temperature any way you like, it's just a constant, right? You measure it in terms, I measure it in terms of 2 pi. I hope you don't mind. Why? Because then the Gaussian, this Gaussian is already normalized. And I don't have to put these prefactors here, which annoy me, because I will always screw it up. Okay? So we keep it that way. Good. So now, you see, when you take this initial condition and you evolve this initial condition under this time evolution, things get kind of interesting, right? Why? Because when you wait, the reservoir will not stay in equilibrium. Why not? Because the reservoir will collide with the particles in the system, and I didn't assume anything about this initial condition, except that it's a density. So the system doesn't stay, the system doesn't stay in equilibrium, the reservoir doesn't stay in equilibrium either. But still, somehow you would expect that the evolution of that guy is close to the evolution, somehow, of that one. So let me explain why you can expect that. Look at the collision rate. Why did we choose mu divided by n? That means that when you take a particle out of your system, particle out of 1 to m, the rate of collision, because it can collide with n particles out of the reservoir, is mu. It's independent of n. When I take now, however, a particle out of the reservoir, what's the rate of collision? Well, a particle of the reservoir can, can collide with m particles in the system, and that gives you mu times m divided by n. All right? So mu m, so let me write this down here. Mu m divided by n. Now you see what this is telling you. When the n is very, very large, the rate of collision, this particle feels in the reservoir, it, it, it hardly collides. The rate is very, very small. So therefore you would expect that this should work out somehow, right? That this thing is very, very close. And in one minute, let me just write down a theorem. Namely, there's a certain distance, e to the L infinity f, tensor gamma n. So gamma n, remember, this is the Gaussian, right? I take the time evolution here of this system with the same initial condition f here. You see, here, I, I just tensor this on so that I can compare this function with the function over there. And then I take the solution of e to the lt f0 with that f0. And this is less than c of f. This is order 1 times m divided by n. And I should say, uniformly in time. And what is d? d of f and g is the soup over all k not equals to 0, the Fourier transform of f minus the Fourier transform of g divided by k squared. Now, and this is called the, Tosca, the, the Gabetta Toscani Wenberg metric, and it's very popular in, in this field, in, in, in Boltzmann equation, right? I mean, it's a little bit fast what I'm telling you here. This metric has wonderful properties. And what we can show is that this time evolution, which is the infinite reservoir, right, the thermostat, with the finite reservoir, is controlled by a term which is, depends, of course, on the initial condition, uniformly in time, m divided by n. And that's a hard one. That took us a long time, OK? So that proves that this intuition which I told you is really correct, OK? Now, just one remark. If you believe that, wouldn't you think that the entropy of such a system should also decay nicely? And that caused some problems for us. And next time, I will tell you a little bit about that, that it actually is not so bad, OK? All right? Good. Thank you. So, sorry. Okay, sorry, Michael, for having okay. to push.